us go to the house of the Lord. Let our feet stand in your gates. It's a blessing to be here. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 in a second. I do want to say something before uh, we get started about uh, Jacob's lesson. Uh, I thought it was really good. And hopefully you did too. I met Jacob, uh, again, we were talking about this a little while ago. I met him when I was actually in college. So maybe some of y'all's age. I was, I was a freshman in college, I think. And, uh, and he was doing a gospel meeting up in Boston from the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't even remember all the other lessons he did, but he did one lesson on embracing weakness. Was that? Do you do a lesson on that? Okay. Um, that I think really changed uh, a lot of the ways that I viewed myself and changed the ways changed some things, some very specific things that I still remember. And that's the blessing of what the Word does, that if you would allow it, that strangers that you don't know, I'm not saying necessarily me, but if that happens in these lessons, that's great too, but that strangers that you don't know change your life because it's not them, it's the Word, and it's Jesus speaking to us through His Word. So, Matthew chapter 7, I want us to start with uh, some of these words. So Jacob also mentioned it in his lesson that he was going to use my verses a little bit, and I'm just going to use his too, so... We're just, you know, we're, we're cool and we're doing that. All right, Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to have somebody read these verses for us. That's also why I want to jot up here. I'm not intending on reading. I want you all to read. Uh, someone read Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 28. This is from the New American Standard 95. Uh, Matthew 7, 24 through 28. Anyone can just start reading. You don't even have to raise your hand. All right, so Matthew 7, verses 24 through 28, you actually have the end of this sermon given by the king. And at the very end of this sermon, he finishes with, with this kind of, this, this is his conclusion. And if you notice some of the things he says in his conclusion, uh, the king is telling us that everyone builds their lives on something. That as, as you think about your life, whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, whether you're a good Christian, a bad Christian, however you want to think about yourself, that everyone is building their lives on something. You actually notice it in the text. There are two men, and what the two men have in common is that both men are building something. They're building a house. And so as you think about your life, maybe ask yourself today, like, as you think about who you are, you know that who you are is based on, like, what you've built your life on. That the things that you do, the things that you think, the ways in which you identify about yourself, it all has to do with what you've built your life on. Which again is not a new idea because that's what Jesus is saying, that everyone is building their lives on something. And what you decide to build your life on says a lot about who you are. And so both people, they're building their lives on something. And what Jesus will actually say is that depending on what you build your life on, he says you end up being one of two choices. What are the two choices? You end up either being what? Wise or you end up being a fool. Notice, he doesn't say if you build a house or didn't build a house, you're wise or a fool. Again, both guys will build a house. The difference between whether you are wise or you are a fool is what you build on. And so again, this is not, none of this is new. None of this is like some revolution that you're like, ah, oh, I've never heard this before. You know this. Like you look at people's lives and you look at what they've built their lives on and you can just look and tell if someone is wise or a fool depending on what you've decided to build your life on. And so again, what you decide to build on, the choices that you make say some things about you. And the reason why I think Jesus is saying this matters is because what you build your life on matters because everyone will go through some storms. And here's the thing, like, our storms may not be exactly the same, but storms are storms. And so if you notice, again, in the text, both people, both men, they go through some storms. In fact, the way Jesus says the storms, is there any difference in what they went through? Like, do you all know, is the, it's the same storm. And again, it may, it may be dressed a little bit differently, but the waters are going to hit everyone. And again, you know the text here. Everyone's going to suffer through some storms. But not everyone will respond the same. And so again, as you think about maybe even why 
we're doing this this weekend, and maybe why the Woodlands here has this as a theme this year, Lord reign in me, is because your life depends on it. Because at the very end of this sermon, the king is saying some things. What he's saying is that you are building your life on something. Whether you realize it or not, your life is being built on something. And that what you build your life on matters. Because it's both saying something about you, but also things are going to happen in your life. If they haven't already happened, things are going to happen in your life that are going to test you. And they're going to try you. And they're going to feel like they're going to beat you down. Whether you stand or not, it's going to be contingent upon what you've built your life on. And in the text, what Jesus says, let's see if we can go back here. In the text, what Jesus says your life is built on isn't even so much. So now think about it, right? If we did this here, we're just like, all right, what does Jesus say your life is built on? You might think, it's like, okay, listening to his words. But actually, in the text, when you read it, you realize that he's not just saying that your life is built on, on the right foundation if you simply listen to the words. Remember, both, even the wise and the fool, they both do what? Look at the yellow. Yeah, they both hear these words of him. But what's the difference between the wise man who builds his house on Jesus and the fool who doesn't? Speak loud. The ears are big, but they don't listen well. So just give me a little volume here. Yeah, it's whether you act on them or not. And so again, here's, here are your options today before we really get into the lesson. Your options are to listen to these words. You have to, I mean, you're, getting, you're here, so you're going to listen to them anyways. But your options are to listen to these words and do them or to listen and choose not to. Again, and, and it will affect the rest of your life, what you decide to do with these words. And so again, this is the king speaking and it's interesting, right, because this is, cause as, as the king is speaking, this is actually what he does. As he tries to help you build your life, help us build our lives on this rock, as this king talks about this kingdom, what he's actually doing is he's inviting us to the kingdom. Someone read the very beginning of the sermon here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. All right, so notice, again, so the king is going to invite you into the kingdom, and this is, I believe, one of the ways in which the king invites you into the kingdom, is he opens his mouth, and he begins to teach. Have you thought of it like that? That the way in which God is inviting you to be a part of the kingdom, the way that God is inviting you to build your life on something different, build your life on something stable, is that he decides to come and to open his mouth and to teach. That's why, by the way, in Matthew 4, multiple times he was going around speaking about the kingdom. It's because this is the way that he invites us in. And so what we're going to do in this lesson is talk a little bit about this idea of, of knowing if I'm in the kingdom. And what are, one of the way, what are one of the ways, and one of the big ways in which we know whether we are in the kingdom of heaven or not. And so again, so the king, he is going to invite you into this kingdom. And just picture this idea, right? So again, in, in Jacob's lesson, he, he set us up. Here comes the king, Matthew 1 through 4. And the king, he's the son of God. He's the king. He's got all these powers. He's, he's, he's lived this perfect life. He stood against temptation. And he's going to invite you into his kingdom. And he opens his mouth. And he's going to start teaching. And what would be the next words that you would expect from the king? From this great proclamation, as he invites you into this kingdom, what do you think? would come next. This is what the king said. Someone read verses 3 through 12 for us. All right, so the king opens his mouth, and he's going to start talking about this kingdom. And he doesn't start saying, and he's like, this kingdom is a kingdom of power. That's not how he starts. 
In fact, in these verses, what word is repeated over and over and over again? Blessed. That as the king opens his mouth and wants to let you know something about what this kingdom is going to be, is that this kingdom is a kingdom of blessings. That there is blessedness in this kingdom. That what he's inviting you into is, is, is a, a way of life that if you decide to build your life on this, that you will be blessed. Which, by the way, as you think about this, whenever the world, and I think, I don't know if this was a few years ago or not, if the world is, I'm not on social media anymore, so I don't know. Like, people were doing, like, the hashtag blessed thing a lot. Is that a thing that happened, or am I just imagining that? I just, okay, thank you. Needed the humans to give me a head nod. I just, all right, so that's the thing that, like, we talk about, like, you know, hashtag blessed or whatever. And in the eyes of the world, you were blessed if you were fill in the blank. Give me some answers. Rich, yes. So if you've got a lot of stuff, you're blessed. Yeah. What else? Yeah, if someone, yeah, if someone just gave you some coffee or something like that, a gift, you're blessed. What else? If you're popular, if you've got all the friends and everybody likes you, man, you're really blessed. You've really got your life built on something. What else? Yeah, if you've got power. If you can make people listen to you and they're going to obey your authority, even if you're the little sister, you're blessed. Yeah, that if everybody just loves you, that you're blessed. The world has a lot of different ways they want to define blessedness. And in this kingdom, Jesus says you can actually find blessedness. You can be blessed, and it has nothing to do with your power with your money, with your beauty, with your intelligence. It has nothing to do with any of that. In fact, he'll say that being in this kingdom and being blessed isn't something that you're born with. It's a decision that you decide to make. That if you're going to, how do I know if I'm in this kingdom or not? It's really a choice. A choice that you make, a choice that I make. So I was born in New York City. Do you know that I did not choose where I decided to be born? My parents just happened to live in New York City. What if I was like, you know what, I don't, I don't like the fact that I'm a New Yorker. I wish I was actually born in Boston, which part of me, that's true. Uh, you don't choose where you're born. You don't choose, in fact, I don't know if you know this or not, for the most part, the vast majority of people, they don't choose where they're citizens. If you're born in the United States of America, you're American. What if you were born in Turkey? You're Turkish. Like that's, you don't choose that. But this kingdom is different in that in this kingdom, Jesus says, you're not born into it like out of some force of will. You're born into this kingdom because you chose to be here. And so as he talks about this blessedness, he'll say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That there are some decisions that you are making, that you are deciding that this is what you're going to build your life on. That you are deciding that this is who you are going to. To be. And so as you think about this blessedness, this blessedness is defined by your character and not by your circumstances. That whether you are blessed or not, that whether you decide to be in this kingdom or not, has nothing to do with your circumstances. And, like, I want you to understand how true this is. Because you could be the poorest person, the ugliest person, the most unloved person by people the most unpopular person, and still be blessed if you decide to do what the king asks you to do. And be just as, much, just as much of the kingdom and a part of the kingdom, the most popular person, that your circumstances do not define if you belong in this kingdom. And I'm thankful for that because we just had a breakout session about raising kids who grow up in the Lord, and my hope is to raise my own kids in the Lord. But that was not my circumstances. That unlike a lot of you, that I was grow I grew up in a home where my dad did witchcraft and sorcery and black magic. You know, like oh, Harry Potter, you're a wizard, Harry. And it wasn't so much like that, but it was more like the Ephesians. They had the, the magic books and you're burning them. Like that was the environment I grew up in. And if I talked a little bit more, like there's a mixed crowd here, so I'd rather not get into all the things that I experienced growing up. My circumstances, on their own, would not let me be a part of this, but it has nothing to do with your circumstances. It's your character and the decisions that you make. And so whether you are a part of God's kingdom or not has very little to do with the family that you were born in. It helps if you're born in the right family, if your family loves the Lord and they teach you about it. 
It'll help you some. But at some point, you've got to make some decisions. At some point, you've got to decide, am I going to be the sort of person that the Lord is wanting me to be? By the way, if you notice in this list, in the, in the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the gentle, those, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the pure in heart, what do you notice about like, some of the things that Jesus says about the blessedness, that blessed are the, that these are the people in the kingdom? What do you all notice about, these, about this list? Does anything stand out to you? Yeah. So the world definitely doesn't look at this and it's like, man, you're so blessed because you're crying right now. You know, or you're hungry. Man, you're really blessed. The world definitely doesn't think that. Yeah, spot on. What else? What are some other things y'all think? Y'all notice here from the text. Yeah. 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 Or being persecuted. Like, that's not the powerful people. Um, maybe even think spiritually about some of this. How do you, huh? Yeah. Yeah, God's not discriminating at all about whether you get to be a part of this kingdom or not. Let me tell you sometimes a challenge. A challenge is that we treat this like some checklist. How do you know when you're poor in spirit? How do you, like, all right, I cried today, so I think I mourned. Okay, so I'm blessed. Cool. Like, is that the way it works? Again, if these things are character traits, then being, being is a citizen. That's stupid. Uh, being a citizen, imagine is isn't, where, isn't the word there. It's something you become. It's not something you do. You do the things that you do because you become this person. But it's not treated as a checklist. And again, this matters because what happens sometimes is we think, so for example, if you want to become a citizen of the United States of America, like my mom, she became a citizen 20 years ago. Uh, my family hails from the Dominican Republic. But if you want to become a citizen, you have to do some things. You don't have to become a certain person. You don't have to be gentle to be American. You don't have to be sweet to be American. You don't have to love your neighbors to be American. You just have to, you know, you have to know some facts. You have to know some details, and you have to take a test. And if you pass the test, boom, you're a citizen of the United States of America. That's not the way this works here. Jesus isn't saying you get to be a citizen if you, like, check the list off. And think about sometimes the temptation for us to be like, okay, I grew up in church. Check. All right, I got baptized, so check. And I partake of the Lord's Supper once a week, so check. So, all right, I'm, I'm a citizen kingdom now. Is that what he's saying here? He says, blessed are th those who, like, it's, it's, being a, cit a citizen kingdom is something you become. It's not something you do, which, by the way, means that it's an ongoing thing. That is something that we're always doing. And so what Jesus will do throughout the rest of this sermon, or throughout the rest of this chapter, excuse me, is that he will kind of show, he'll show you this in action, right? So he'll show you that being a part of the kingdom is something you become and not just something you do. And the way he'll do it is he'll say, okay, you have heard some things. You'll notice the way that people have thought maybe about the kingdom of God, the ways in which the Jews have thought about the kingdom of God. But let me show you what it actually is. And so what I want us to do is just to, to see it really quickly. Uh, and then we'll have some, some, some kind of concluding thoughts here. But he, he goes and he'll say, you have heard that it was said. Let me get the clip here. Okay. You have heard that it was said. And then he goes through the list. So by the way, let's, let's just ask ourselves this. We won't do all of them, but we'll try to do some of them. Don't murder. All right, raise your hand if you did not murder anyone today. I would hope everyone has their hand raised. All right, cool. So if you were a Jew, you would think, great, I'm a part of God's people. And I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing because I didn't kill anyone. All right? You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. I think I'm safe with this one. Everyone raise your hand if you did not commit adultery today. All right? So you're like, all right, cool. I'm still in the list. All right? You have heard that it was said, like, if you're going to divorce your spouse, just make sure you give her, like, the, the, you know, the, the divorce papers. All right? So raise your hand uh, <laughs> if you gave your spouse divorce papers if you decided to divorce her today. Or if you did not divorce your spouse. The silly one, you think of it like that. Raise your hand if you didn't make false vows today. Raise your hand if you didn't retaliate for some evil someone did to you today. So far, I'm good. I'm looking good right now. Uh, raise your hand if, you love the, if today you love the people that are close to you, like your friends, your families, your kids, whatever. You see the temptation? It's to think, I'm a part of the kingdom because, I, look, we just went through this list. And for the most part, 
Everybody kind of raised their hand, so check, check, check. I'm good. You know what I mean? I'm a kingdom citizen. And remember, Jesus says that real blessedness to actually being a part of the kingdom is something you become. It's not something you do, that it's a choice, that you decide that I am going to live differently, that I'm going to be different. And so it's a choice that you make. And so what he actually says is instead of you listening to that, you have heard that it was said this. You have heard that it was said, don't kill people. We say that's not actually the standard, that the standard, like Jacob said, the standard is so much higher. It's so much deeper that being a part of the kingdom isn't an external thing, that it is an internal thing. So what he actually says is, but truly I say to you, so we won't raise our hands, but I wondered if we'd had the same amount of hands raised. If I said, raise your hands, if you didn't call your brother an idiot today, we're not going to raise our hands just in case someone did do that today. I don't want to shame anyone. Or raise your hand if you didn't get angry at someone today. That raise your hand if you didn't lust today. Or if you did lust, that you actually cut your eye, you plucked your eye out, or you cut your hand off. Like, Ray, you can raise your hand if that's what you did. Um, raise your hand that you are in your marriage and that you are committed to being in that marriage. You didn't just leave just because you felt like it. Raise your hand that you're going to be honest all the time and that you're going to mean what you say. So if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And that's what I've done today that I didn't retaliate, that instead of retaliating, in fact, I looked for opportunities to serve people. That I didn't just love people who love me, but in fact, people who have hurt me, that I've decided to pray for them. Like, what if we did raise your hand if you prayed for the people who have hurt you today? And for the people um, who have cursed you, that you've blessed them, that you've tried to serve them. See how this is a little bit deeper? how the first things you can kind of do on autopilot. I think most people can just kind of live their lives and not kill someone. That's, I think most people can live their lives and not commit adultery. I, I would like to hope so. Like, you can do those things on autopilot. But what Jesus is actually requiring of you here is going to be more than just some actions. That you have to become someone different. That you have to be someone new. And that this, the, these things, like where do these things stem from? Like not calling your brother, like not getting angry. Or, or being honest all the time, or loving your enemies. Like, where do these things stem from? I'm going to give you all a hint. Just look at my hands here. From where? From the heart. That if, if you want to be a part of the kingdom... You have to give the Lord your heart. You want to know what kingdom you're in? Who are you listening to right now? Like, that's the way you give, that's the way you give anyone your heart. I love my wife. My wife is absolutely great. And she's not even here. So like, y'all know I really mean it. No, but she's, she's awesome. Her name's Heather. She's the best. Um, you know where that started, though? started to love her and get to, like, when I got to know her, and I started to hear her and spend time with her. And, like, you want to know, you want to change? Start changing your actions, start changing who you are, start loving the Lord more? You have to start changing who you're listening to. You have to start listening to him more. You have to get out of the, you have heard that it was said, and think that life is just driven by, by the bare minimum and start saying, okay, I'm going to give whatever it is I can give. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek to hear anything that God has to say because I want to have a relationship with him, because I want to know him. So this is kind of where I want us to, to, to come to a head at here. So how do you know which kingdom you're in? I'm going to leave you with four ideas here. And I hope that it encourages you. But how do I know whose kingdom I'm in? The first idea, and they're all up there. Now, it's not supposed to be like that, but we're going to just roll with it. How do I know which kingdom I'm in? Whose voice do I recognize as authoritative? Remember, uh, everyone is listening to someone. And who you listen to affects who you become. Who you listen to affects what you think blessed and it is. You know why the reason, you know the reason why a lot of people think that being blessed means having money or having power or being beautiful? is because that's what a lot of voices say. A lot of people are going around saying that if you are going to be blessed, this is what it is. And there's just a lot of nonsense being spoken. You don't know if you are in the kingdom of the king 
start changing who you're listening to. That the person who you're listening to, like we read in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28, verse 18, that this king says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. You know what all authority means? All authority means how much authority? It means how much authority? It means how much authority? About everything. That like what you decide to do with your time, that what you decide to post on social media, that how you decide to dress, that how you decide to pre treat people, how you decide to think about yourself, that all of that is fall, falls under the umbrella of who the king is and the voice that you're listening to. All the behaviors we have are learned behaviors. All of them are. You know that, right? That the things that you do, the ways that you behave, you learn that through hearing people and through watching people. That if you want to be a part of the kingdom of the king, that you have to start changing who you listen to. That the king has ultimate authority. And this, I'm telling you, like this, if you're willing to, to believe that and to live your life with that, it will change your life. The king has more authority than the president does. He has more authority than your parents do. And that, that one's important. The king has more authority than your parents do. I, again, I think that most of your parents are good parents, I'm just assuming, making an assumption. But when I was in high school, I remember one summer I was reading through Exodus in the living room, and my mom came in, and she was like, you know, it's okay to read your Bible, but you don't have to be a fanatic. If my mom is the ultimate authority, then what happens? And I am a fanatic. I love the Bible. I love God. I don't care. But what happens if your parents are the ultimate authority? Then maybe school gets the preference over the Lord. Then maybe sports or your job or whatever college you're going to go to, that that's more important than the Lord, and it's not. The voice of the king is ultimately completely authoritative. He has all authority on heaven and on earth. That's how you know if you're a part of this kingdom. That you know that you're a part of this kingdom if you view your mission, now that you're a citizen of this kingdom, that you view your mission to be an ambassador. That now you view your life as one where the things that I'm doing, I'm doing because I actually want to show how great my king is. And so I do these good works so that other people may see God and that they may glorify him. That that's now how I live my life. That I'm not living it to be seen and to get likes from people. That I'm not seeing it to be followed by people. That the way that I'm living my life, the ways that I make my decisions, the things that I'm doing, I'm not doing it so that I'm heard. I'm doing it so that people hear him, so that people seek him, so that people want to love him. You want to know if you're a part of this kingdom? Are you drawing lines with how you live your life? You know what I mean by that, right? Like, I went to church already. I don't have to read my Bible later on. I don't have to pray. We prayed all together. What's the point of that? That I'm going to pick and choose how I'm going to serve God and how much I'm going to give God. Could you imagine if God picked and chose how much he was going to give you? God was like, all right, I'll give you life. And I'll give you some blessings, but giving you my son, I don't know about that. Like, could you imagine if God drew lines and what he was willing to do in his service and his love for you, where we'd be? God didn't draw lines. You can't either. That being a part of this kingdom is complete and ultimate devotion. That I'm going to, if I'm going to hear everything he says, then I'm going to do whatever he's asking of me. And here's the beauty of this is that when I'm a part of this kingdom, I'm not just some person in this kingdom. Jacob said the story with him meeting J George Bush, which I thought was funny. The king isn't just like, I know. But you're not just some citizen in this kingdom, that you're a part of the family. That's one of the words, by the way, that's repeated over and over again in, in the Sermon on the Mount, is that the king, whenever the king talks about his father, he says, our father, your father that you know that you're a part of this kingdom if you get to be a part of the family and if you behave like you are a part of the family. By the way, I don't think any of this is easy. It's not easy in my life. Maybe it's easy for you. I don't know. It's not easy for me. But maybe that's why in, in, in Luke's account of the end of Matthew 7, um, get back, there we go. Luke says, or Jesus says, everyone who comes to me and here's my word and acts on them. I will show you whom, it's the right way to say it, he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. 
And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built the house on the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. All right, do you notice, by the way, whenever he talks about the wise man, and if you saw the slide, I gave the answer away. There's something that, that Luke records for us in Luke 6 that isn't in Matthew 7 about what the wise man does when he builds his house on the rock. Do you notice the difference? He laid a foundation, uh, and right before that, he dug deep. So he lays a foundation, and he digs deep. Here's maybe, I think, the point. And I think that everybody's got sand in their hearts. That everybody's got voices that they've heard, things that they've seen, whether it's through the media, whether it's social media, whether it's your friends, your family, maybe family who aren't Christians, maybe family who are Christians and aren't saying the things that the Lord is actually saying, whether it's like school, everybody's got things, voices that they've heard that are sand. You know what the wise man does? You know what people in the kingdom do? They dig deep. They dig that sand out. By the way, I've never dug sand, but my guess is, is it wouldn't be very easy. It might be kind of time-consuming. But if you're willing to dig deep, to dig that thing out of your heart and lay the foundation and build your life on the words of Jesus, that what you end up having is you end up having this security and this stability, that you end up having your life built on something that the world cannot shake. It's the reason why, by the way, we live in a world that people are constantly like, dealing with different issues and different problems, and they're constantly anxious, and they're constantly trying to change themselves, and they're constantly trying... You know what? They're, they're, they're shaken because they've built their lives on sand, a lot of little sand. You think about sand versus a rock. Sand isn't stable. But the words of this king, the life of this king, and what this king wants of you, if you're willing to build your life on this, you will be blessed, you will be secure, and you will be stable. Thank you for your attention. I will praise you with all of-